All right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are looking at lesson 75. Woohoo! That makes me want to sing. We're talking about numbers. Numbers four. That's in numero quattro. <laughs> numbers four, you guys. You're doing it. We're going through the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and now... Numbers. What do you know? Can you think back with me on Numbers 1 when we started talking about how Moses had to rally 12 guys and gather 12 for one reason. Kevin, let's go to Kevin on uh, door number one. Why did they have to go get the tribe? Kevin's like, wait, what's the question? <laughs> they needed to like count the guys eligible for the draft. Ooh, nice. And not everybody was, because it said they only picked the guys that could serve for the army. And they were, Shelly, what was the ages again? Do you remember? For the army, it was 20 and over. 20 and over. Female? Uh, no, just the guys. Just male. Now, that's not the case today with the Israeli Defense Force. It's IDF. Everybody has to serve, male and female. But in this case, in numbers one, yes. Kevin, you're really good at this number. Do you remember how many people it ended up being that they had in the army? 603, 550. 603,550. So that was the census that they were told. But then, Rich, here we have the Levites. The Levites were kind of on the side. Did they have to fight or did they not fight, Rich? They uh, were conscientious objectors. They were CEOs, right? They went to the Church of the Brethren or they were Mennonite, right? And they were Levites and they didn't have to fight. That's why, because they had to work around and they got to work around uh, the tabernacle and work alongside Aaron and his sons. It's a super cool role, Numbers 1. And then in Numbers 2, what you have is those 12 tribes that Kevin uh, was talking about of this army, that they have this encampment. And Numbers 2 basically tells them that he's going to say, all right, Judah, here's your encampment. Go out. Reuben, here's your encampment. Go out. Ephraim, go out. Dan, go out. And so they're sending these guys out to position themselves. And that's Numbers 2. But then you get into Numbers 3, what we talked about yesterday. And this is where we're talking about Aaron and the priests. And they're different than the Levites. The Levites were the ones who were doing everyday work. That's not a negative comment because they were, they were God's firstborn. They were his chosen people, his tribe. He's saying, I am with, because they're getting everything ready for Aaron and Eleazar and uh, uh, Ithamar. And so here you have the role of the priesthood, the role of the, of the Levites. And in all of this, where are they, Kevin? Where are they at right now? In the wilderness of Sinai. And so I love what you guys had mentioned during the break. It's kind of like we're doing Revive Wilderness. You know, can you imagine? We did Indiana for 52 days. They're doing this for Revive, Revive Wilderness for 40 years. Mm, sounds hot. Mm, it's a lot of the same food. <laughs> it sounds like mashed potatoes and gravy in Indiana, doesn't it, every day? So we have Revive Wilderness. You've got everything in place. And here's the best part. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, Shelly, if you could go there for me, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, it describes Jesus' role in the wilderness as they're going through all this. Now, I love Minnie's painting. I mean, is this not incredibly powerful? I mean, it's unbelievable. We'll get to some of this about what this looks like over the course of time, but just notice the cloud back here. Notice the water here, the rock, the feet, the, the another Israeli flower that we'll talk to. Again, I feel like I'm a, a meteorologist. Uh, if you'll notice here, the easterly winds are coming in. Uh, what I love is, is that this rock, <laughs> the hail, right? Uh, this is the rock of Christ. Uh, this is an incredibly powerful picture by many. Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, and all drank the same spiritual drink. Remember, in their, as they're in their wilderness, for they drank from a spiritual rock that followed them. So as they're wandering around in the wilderness, the scripture says a rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So as we kind of plow through the numbers, and we really are plowing through practical numbers, I want you to have this picture of the rock as every time they put their foot down, every time the 5,000 are walking, every time the 10,000 are walking, every time the 45,000 are walking, guess what? That rock is Christ. He's the one that's supporting them. He's the one that's with them in the wilderness. So now today, I want to talk a little bit more in detail, okay? What we're going to do is look over here on this screen is that here you have the, uh, the Merariites, the Gershonites, the Gohathites, and then you have the Moses, Aaron, and priests. They're surrounding the tabernacle. We're going to talk more about the role of the Levites today in Numbers 4. So specifically, Numbers 4, verse 1. Scripture says this, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. Okay, now it's, it's interesting. It flipped. Earlier it was Aaron and then Moses, but this time it's Moses and Aaron. Hey, Rich, just for fun, I think this is a good test. Uh, do you remember which one's older, Moses or Aaron? 
Yeah, that would be Aaron. Do you remember the age difference? Three years. Three years. Wow. Revive School is paying off every day. You keep doing this. Uh, and so look what it says in verse 2. It says this. It says, Among the Levites, okay, take a census of the Kohathites by their clans and their ancestral houses. So men from 30 years old to 50 years old, everyone who's qualified to do the work of the, of, at the tent of meeting. So we just, didn't we just do this? Do you remember this? In Numbers, uh, in Numbers 1, we did a census with the military. But then in Numbers 3, just yesterday, we talked about the census of all of the Levites. But the difference was what, Kevin? Do you remember the last census, what, what the ages were? Uh, one month older and older. Yeah, one month old and older. It just sounds right and weird, but that's right. One month old and older. Now we're just taking a 30 to 50 year old window. And the reason is, you got to remember, is that in Leviticus 8, verse 24, Shelley, if you'll go there, Leviticus 8, verse 24, now what we're going to find out in the census is who actually of the Levites can actually do the work. Okay, so it says this. Uh, I said Leviticus, didn't I? I bet it's Numbers 8, 24. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. I'm sorry. Uh, it just says this. In regard to the Levites, from 25 years old or more, a man enters the service in the work at the tent of the meeting. And so here we have thousands and thousands of people that qualify as a Levite from different categories. Okay, let me give you... Uh, well, we'll get into this. But what I love is they're getting very specific right now of the, those that are 30 years and above. Okay, so we're going to walk through this, a little bit more of this difference, the qualifications. The one thing I do want to say is, is that, Kevin, we talked about Moses. If Moses comes from uh, the Levitical line, right? Uh, Aaron, because he's his brother, obviously is going to. But Shelley, if you would, would you go to 1 Chronicles 6, verse 2, just to give us a little bit of support about where we get this from, okay? So Aaron comes from this line, Kohath's uh, sons. Amram, Esar, Hebron, and Uziel. And then verse 3, then it says Amram's children. Look at this. Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. And then there it goes, Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. So the lineage is all within, what Kevin, what you just said, but I think it's good for people to see in 1 Chronicles 6, 2, and 3. All right, so we're going to look for people that fit between 30 and 50 years old. Now in verse 4, we're going to start walking through the Kohathites. The service of the Kohathites at the tent of the meeting concerns the most holy subjects. And so sometimes when, you, when we studied Leviticus, you know how it felt like in chapter 18, it gave all of these conditions that made you queasy and ask kids to leave the room. But then in Leviticus 20, do you guys remember, we talked all about the punishments for all the things that they did. And you're like, ah, this just feels repetitive. It's going to feel like that a little bit today in Numbers 4. But now we're just going to give you a little bit more substance. And so I'm going to write down these names, the Kohathites, okay? All right, so here you have the Kohathites. And they're going to be known for what? The holy objects, right? Okay. The holy objects. And that's a really, really important. So if they're the holy objects, do you remember which son of Aaron's sons are the ones that are the overseer for the Kohathites? Remember, he only does it one time, and the other brother has two of them. It's Ith Ith Ithamar has the two. Ithamar is the Marites and the Gershonites. It's the one. Good try, Kevin. You have 50-50 chance. And so El Eleazar, okay, he is the overseer for the Kohathites. Okay? But they're known for the holy, uh, the holy objects. Okay? So a couple of things. Whenever the camp is about to move uh, on Aaron and his sons are to go in to take down the screening veil and cover the Ark of the Testimony with it. Now, Kevin, you guys have talked about this. I loved your guys' perspective. And Rich, well, talk to me a little bit about the taking down the screening veil. Well, it was specific that the high priest was the one to go into to the Holy Holy. Which would have been Aaron. Once a year. Yep. And so if they're going to move, the ark's going to come out of that environment. So they have to go in and cover it. So other people besides yep. Aaron don't go into that place. So they can't see it. That's right. So Kohathites are a part of that crew. They're the part because they're dealing with the holy objects. But Aaron and the priests are the ones that have to go. We don't see the Kohathites come into the nope. picture until way right. later, until all the stuff is basically packed up, ready for them to come in. You got in. it. You got it. Good stuff. 
Okay, so just so you know, so this is how they have this connection with the Kohathites, the holy objects, and then Aaron and his sons, okay? They all have different roles, and they're obviously, Scripture continues on in verse 6, they're to place over this a covering made of manatee skin, spread a solid blue cloth on top, and insert its poles. And then what it does is it really just begins to unpack their roles. Okay, so they are to spread a blue cloth over the table of the presence and place the plates and cups on it, as well as the bowls and the pitchers for the drink offering. The regular bread offering is to be on it. And in verse 8, then they're to spread a scarlet cloth over them, cover them with a covering made of manatee skin and insert the poles into the table. When, when I see this, you guys, I automatically go back to Exodus. Don't you guys? And you think about how to make and, and build the tabernacle. And so I see these colors that are popping up already. You have the blue, you have the scarlet, you know, eventually we're going to get into some, some of the purple. And so like here you have that royalty cover, colors again. You know, it makes me think of the priests. Remember that they used to say that the priests were, uh, you know, a, a miniature tabernacle because they're wearing basically the same outfit as the tabernacle. And so it just kind of has everything just continues to tie together. And the Levites are a part of this process. Now watch in verse 9. It just says, They're to take a blue cloth, cover the lampstand, uh, used for light, with his lamp, snuffers, and fire pans, as well as its jars of oil by which they service it. Continues on in verse 10. Then they must place it with all its utensils inside a covering made of manatee skin and put them on the carrying frame. Again, just because of time, it literally you just it reads right through of different roles interacting with the holy objects. Verse 12 talks about serving utensils. Verse 13 talks about removing the ashes from the bronze altar. Verse 14 talks about placing the equipment on it that they use in serving the fire pans, the meat forks, the shovels, the basins, all of the equipment of the altar. And I think what I what I appreciate uh, about this is that it, all of this is super important. You know, when we do Revive Florida, when we do Revive Indiana, when we do Revive Ohio, Revive Texas, you know, somebody is always staying back, taking the Bibles, taking the bands, putting them together in packages, putting them in bags, putting them in barrels, printing out maps, getting it all ready so that everybody can just walk in and get what they need. So in this context, and I know it sounds extreme, but we all are, are the priests, all of us. Scripture says in the New Testament, we are the royal priesthood. And, it's, and it's, in a fun way, it's like people are setting it up so that we can go represent him as the priest today. And so I just, different roles, everybody plays these different roles from, you know, camera crew, uh, sound stuff, like all of this just to get on video, looking at different scripture verses, all of this is essential to point people to the Lord. So I just want to make sure people don't miss that. Um, now, watch what it says in verse 15. Aaron and his sons are to finish covering the holy objects and all their equipment when, whenever the camp is to move on. Now, here we go. The Kohathites, then they come in and they carry them, but they're not to touch the holy objects or they will die. These are the transportation duties of the Kohathites regarding the tent of meeting. You know, I do love the Kohathites. You know, in Elkhart County, these guys would be called the toters. They'd be called the transporters. They're the guys transporting, right? Very simply, the holy objects. Now, this did happen. There's a guy, unfortunately, Kevin or Shelly, if you'll go to 2 Samuel 6, verse 6, I, I wouldn't play the game, hey, do not touch. <laughs> For 2 Samuel 6, it says, When they came to Nacon's threshing fold, Uzzah reached out to the ark of God and took hold of it because the oxen had stumbled. So in Uzzah's defense... He was just making sure like, hey, it's not going to fall. I'm going to take care of it. And then in verse 7, then the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah. And God struck him dead on the spot for his irreverence. And he died there next to the ark of God. So when it says in verse 15 of Numbers 4, and it says, oh, by the way, don't touch or you'll die. It, it actually it happened. And, you know, we talked about this with, with Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus. There always has to be a first. Those guys learn, don't bring in the unauthorized fire. This guy learned, don't touch the box when it's falling. And now every time it's falling, like, mm -mm. <laughs> ain't touching that ark. I mean, that's kind of the feel of, of what happens. And so again, people are learning in this process so that we could actually benefit from it as well. 
All right, so let's get into verse 16. So we've talked about the Kohathites and their role. Then now watch what specifically it says in verse 16. Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, has oversight of the lamp oil, the fragrant incense, the daily grain offering, and the anointing oil. So he oversees four specific things, okay? The lamp oil, the fragrant incense, the daily grain offering, and the anointing oil. He has oversight also of the entire tabernacle and everything in it, the holy objects and their utensils. That's why Eleazar is the sponsor for the Kohathites. <laughs> he's the guy, he, he's the supervisor, because if he's overseeing the holy objects, the Kohathites have to transport it. That would mean that these guys have a great relationship. Then it says in verse 17, then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. Scripture continues on, do not allow the Kohathite tribal clans to be wiped out from the Levites. Well, in verse 19, Scripture says, do this for them so that they may live and not die when they come near the most holy objects. In other words, every day their job could be on the line. So Aaron and his sons are to go in and assign each man his task and transportation duty. Verse 20, the Kohathites are not to go in and look at the holy objects, even for a moment or they will die. And so they know that. And so this is the precautions that they're told. Aaron, Eleazar says, please, it's what we talked about, the screening veil. Please don't let them go in. If they look at it, scripture will say, you'll be the first and you'll die. So Again, I remember how we talked about how a lot of this is going to feel repetitive from what we just talked about. But what we're saying is, is, hey, Kohathites, as you take care of the tabernacle over here, please make sure you understand your role. And it's very, very important. Just because you're not out here fighting, just because you're not out here defending, you, you're doing an incredible job as the firstborn for Israel. All right, let's get into uh, the Gershonites, okay, in verse 21. So here you have the Kohathites, and now we are going to get into the Gershonites. Not to be confused with the Goshenites. The Lord spoke to Moses, take a census of the Gershonites also by their central houses and their clans. Verse 23, register men. So again, same exact feel. You're going to see this a lot in numbers, especially even tomorrow's lesson or uh, in two days lesson. It's going to feel this repetition, just fill in the blank with the name. Well, you're looking for Gershonites. Make sure you're finding men from 30 years old to 50 years old who will qualify to perform service, to do work at the at the end, at the tent of the meeting. The scripture continues on. This is the service of the Gershonite clans regarding work and transportation duties. Okay, this is kind of a fun one. So this is what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to transport the tabernacle curtains, the tent of the meeting with its covering, and the covering made of manatee skin on top of it. The screen for the entrance to the tent of the meeting. And it continues in verse 26. And then you're supposed to take care of a lot more. The hangings of the courtyard, the screen for the entrance. Uh, at the gate of the courtyard that surrounds uh, the tabernacle and the altar. Man, who wants to deal with screens? You know how hard that, if you have a cat, you know what they do to screens, you know? You're like, you know, I just replaced this. Man, working at my dad's ace, it's kind of like, hey, who wants to replace the screen? Uh, you know, you're playing rock, paper, scissors, so you don't have to do it. You know, it's like, this is a hard, these guys are like tangible guys that are dealing with the daily weather and all that kind of stuff. You know, like they're out there with the trenches, along with their ropes, their equipment, and then they got to carry out everything that needs to be done with these items. Verse 27, all of the service of the Gershonites, all the transportation duties and all other work has to be done at the command of Aaron and his sons. And you're to assign them all that they are responsible to carry. Verse 28, this is the service of the Gershonite clans at the tent of the meeting. And their duties will be under the direction, so here we go now, of Ithamar, uh, the son of Aaron the priest. All right, so let's, let's keep going here. Let's keep talking about some of the, the other folks. Uh, as for the Mar Mar uh, mm -hmm. Marariites, Ferrari, right? Marari. Hmm. Uh-oh. As the Marariites, okay, you are to register by them clans. Everything's to register by their clans. They're in central houses, verse 31. Again, the same age as 30 to 50 years old. And then this is what they're responsible to do, okay? To carry as the whole of the service at the tent of the meeting. They are to take care of the supports of the tabernacle with its crossbars, posts, bases. Verse 32, scripture continues, the posts of the surrounding courtyard, the tent pegs, the ropes, all of the equipment, all the work related to them. You're to assign them by name. And so these guys, I mean, they're responsible for the framework. It doesn't say anything about welding. You think, Rich? No, there's no welding involved. There's overlaid, but no welding. Genius. It's good. Anyway, so this is the service of the Marite clan. Uh, and then look who are they under the direction of. Okay. So Ithamar, 
son of Aaron, okay? These guys go together, and then these guys are kind of their own special case. Kind of a cool picture, but it's, it goes back to all of their roles. The Kohathites are on the south side of the tabernacle. The Gershonites are on the west side of the tabernacle, and the Merariites are on the north side, okay? And that is their home base. But what's interesting is, is that some of them, though, once they're here, their jobs might take them all over the place, okay? So they don't just stay there. That would be weird. They have jobs. They got to do their jobs. And so here we go. Let's continue to unfold this. Now in verse 34, remember, they were told to actually do this census, the second census of the ages 30 to 50. The first one was from the one month old to however old they are. Now we're getting very, very specific that says these are the only ones that are qualified to do the work. Because remember, in Numbers 8, it says the beginning stages of you to serve as an apprentice for being a Levite, practicing this out is at the age of 25. So now what we want to know is how many are 30 to 50. That means they can actually do the work. Well, it says in verse 34, Moses, Aaron, the leaders of the community, they registered the Kohathites by their clans and their central houses. Verse 35, men from 30 to 50, okay? They're qualified. It says the men registered for, by their clans numbered, it was this, okay? It was 2,750, okay? There you have those men are to what? What's their main job? Kevin, if I was to say one thing that the Kohathites have to do, what's their job to take care of? There's to take care of the holy. The holy objects. That's it. So these guys, this is how they're wired. And I, I'm going to go all sports on you for a second. Like, you know, if you are, you know, with the New England Patriots, okay? For an example, the way you're going to learn your offense, that's the only way you're going to know. You, you just know the Patriots offense. What I love about being a Kohathite is everything you're going to be taught from 25 to 30 is how to interact with the holy objects you know, and to prepare them, to carry them, all of that stuff. So you're specifically being and taught a trade. It's pretty cool when you actually think about how, how amazing this is. Now, interesting enough, in Numbers 4, verse 28, the original number that they counted, okay, was 8,600. So now this is how many are qualified. That's it. That's the only amount of people that are qualified to actually begin to do the work. Okay, let's keep on going. In verse 38, let's get to the Gershonites. The Gershonites were registered by their class in their ancestral houses, men again from 30 to 50, okay? Now, let me just cheat here for a second. Just so you know, in Numbers um, 3, verse 22, it says the number that they counted, everybody, one month and older was 7,500. But the only people that were qualified, according to Numbers 4, verse 40, uh, was 2,630. Which says to me, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. If you look at the numbers here on your, on, your, uh, on your blackboard, I would, at first my thought was, is will they require more, more priests or more Levites in one area? But it's really not the case. I mean, it's pretty much the same difference almost. It's a thousand almost, maybe a thousand more for the Kohathites. But I would think outside on the coverings, you'd think it'd be more requirement, more, more of a work ethic, but maybe not necessarily the case. So anyway, I just... Those that are analysts, I'm sure you're processing, oh, I wonder what the exact number, I mean, there's your numbers for you, okay? All right, let's get to the, Mar uh, the Merariites, okay? The Merariites, okay, Shelly, if you'll go to verse 44. All right, we do know that the qualified, the Merariites, okay, to do the framework, okay, I'm sure is a ton of work, is 3,200. We know, though, back in chapter 3, the number that they originally counted was 6,200. So here you have all kinds of numbers. These are actually the ones that can do the work now. They're qualified. So what this says to me, just a simple, a simple lesson, okay? I'm going to totally take a rabbit trail here. Can you go to 2 Timothy 2, 2? 2 Timothy 2, 2, and I don't know why. 2 Timothy 2, 2. Uh, it just says this, And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. When I see the Merariites, Merariites, I see 3,200 between the ages of, what, 30, 30 years to 50 years. And what I see is, is I see 3,200 guys, men, that now can also train 3,000 more. And so what I see is, is a discipleship process. You know what I really see? It's not based on one guy. It's multiple people in order to get the work done. 
if we're not careful in the American church, if we always think we're the only ones that are qualified and we're never raising up more Merariites or never raising up more Gershonites or we're never raising up more Kohoathites, uh, guess what? Once we're done at the age of 50, you got nobody else to step into your role. And then you know what? It's just done. Our job is to be fruitful and multiply. And I actually think, yes, that even means in the area of, of ministry. And this is an incredible example of helping more people learn about the presence of God, train them for five years. Can you imagine committing to saying, I'm going to train somebody for five years on how to carry wooden frames? Like, dude, you should have picked this up on six months. But I, th I think that's, the, we don't have the patience in American culture. We don't have the patience to say, come on, man, let's go. No, but part of the apprenticeship, apprenticeship, a part of the disciple, Jesus did this for three years with 12 guys and one guy didn't even get it. You look at the apostle Paul in Acts 19, he poured into 12 men, 12 men. And it says that he had them for every day at the school of Tyrannus, 12 men for two years daily. But it said that all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. To me, when I see 2 Timothy 2.2 2, and it says, what you've heard from me in the presence of many others, they should be able to commit to faithful men who then those men should be able to teach others. This cycle, you should never run out of Gershonites. You should never run out of Merariites. You should never run out of Kohathites. You should never run out. Why? Because a disciple is always making a disciple. Oh, sorry, God, I just forgot to train somebody for the last five years. I kind of feel like God would strike you down dead. <laughs> in this context. And so I just, I feel like it's an incredible picture of Aaron and Eleazar and Ithamar, okay? Those are like the, the Peter, James, and uh, Johns, right? To me, that's like the core. And then the core spreads them out to the qualified of the Levites. And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with you guys. And then these qualified, guess what they do? Then they start training up those that aren't even qualified. And then it just, it keeps going. And so just as a practical question inside your church, a practical question inside your business, practical question, uh, wherever you're at, are you always looking to replace yourself? Because that should be your number one goal. Replace yourself, but more importantly than just that, so that they multiply, so that this takes off. I'm praying, you guys, that revive school, okay? Drastic. I'm praying that it radically multiplies. Can you believe this, you guys? Revive Indiana started with 56 guys, 56 guys in a barn uh, off of County Road 35. And you know what the craziest thing is? In two years, two years, Tom, you ready to do the math? Should we do the math again? This is crazy to me, okay? Right now, you wanna know how many we're saying is qualified? 56. <laughs> but you wanna know what we're praying for? You may remember the number? It's 28,000 something, isn't it? 28,000. We're praying that by the end of two years, two years, we will see 56 men Go all the way to 28,000. How? Because Jesus did it with 12. Paul did it with 12. We believe we can do it with 56. And then these guys, they got all kinds of numbers. And all I want to keep saying is, is all it takes is one buddy at a time. These men right here, these Levites, they believe that God's called them. They believe that they've been ordained. They believe that they've been anointed to do the work of the Lord. And that's strangely enough, what I love about numbers, these numbers show there's more that they can train. And what you'll see is, is as a result of more to being trained, guess what? More get to experience the presence of God. There you have it. There you have it. Numbers four. Lesson 75. I hope and pray it's encouraged you very simply to go find a Gershonite, <laughs> to go find a Merariite, go find a Kohathite, go find a disciple that you can raise up. Why? So that they can begin to teach somebody else. All right. We look forward to talking with you tomorrow on Lesson 76. Thanks.